Hey everyone, I'm the pro wrestling VTuber dedicated to love and justice, Kit Saberfang. And if you're like me, then you've no doubt already binged your way through the Netflix original series, The Queen of Villains. And now you're fired up about pro wrestling and wondering, well, what do I watch now? And how do I experience the real life acts of Dump Matsumoto and Crush Gals? I'm here to share that knowledge with real world matches that inspired the series, fellow YouTubers chronicling the true history of Joshi wrestling in the 1980s, and even suggestions for other wrestling dramas, documentaries, and active promotions to check out as well. There will be links for everything we're discussing in the description below, as well as YouTube cards throughout the video. If you're not familiar with the show, Queen of Villains is a Netflix original series chronicling the rise of one of pro wrestling's greatest heels, Dump Matsumoto, during the biggest boom period of Japanese women's wrestling and arguably Japanese wrestling as a whole. You may not be super familiar with names like the Beauty Pair or Crush Gals, but the popularity of Crush Gals in particular rivaled that of even the biggest WWF acts of their golden era. They really were that huge overseas and an important part of pro wrestling history. And when the show was announced, I was thrilled and hoped for, at best, a decent show to point people towards when it comes to telling the near untold story in the West of when Japanese women's wrestling ruled the world. And whoa, was I blown away with how Queen of Villains turned out. It's legitimately one of the best shows of the year with a wonderful ensemble cast, strong performances and overall production, and backed by some of the most authentic portrayals of pro wrestling seen in a scripted drama. Seriously, if you haven't already, stop what you're doing and watch The Queen of Villains on Netflix. If you're on my channel, I already know you love pro wrestling and you've got to check it out. This video will still be here for when you're done. And speaking of my channel, while you're here, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like and subscribe. Subscribing to my channel is the best and easiest way to support me on my pro wrestling journey. We talk a lot about women's wrestling on this channel, so if you're looking to get more involved in the scene, joining the Saber Gang is a step in the right direction. Okay, ready to dive into those matches? Let's start with an infamous retirement bout between tag team partners that was featured in the very first episode. The Queen of Villains opens at the end of an era for Japanese women's wrestling. The 1979 Loser Must Retire match between top stars at the time Jackie Sato and Maki Ueda Data, best known together as Beauty Pair. Following in the pop idol meets pro wrestler footsteps previously tackled by AJW's first star, Mak Fumiake, Beauty Pair are considered the first true breakout stars of Japanese women's wrestling. Their athleticism and natural charisma made them a gifted tag team in their own right, and their glamorous, tomboy look certainly didn't hurt when it came to riding the androgynous wave set by a popular shoujo manga at the time, the Rosa Versale but that's another story altogether. Before we get in too deep, it's important to note that Netflix's The Queen of Villains is only a semi-biographical take on the career of Dump Matsumoto and the Joshi wrestling scene at the time. It sticks to the general facts for the most part, but one aspect of pro wrestling it takes liberties with is the real versus predetermined nature of its matches. And in an effort to juice up the drama, Queen of Villains often insinuates that many of its climactic matches came down to true, no punches pulled combat, where the winner would be determined in an act actual fight, or what we call in wrestling, a shoot. The truth is more muddled than you might expect, but for the most part, and with this match in particular, no, this was not the result of a real fight. While it's often assumed that Jackie Sato had been in a romantic relationship at the time, thus violating her contractual idol-style agreements with AJW, Maki Ueda lost the match and retired due to many of her own circumstances, including a litany of injuries and the non-stop nature of the business, making it difficult for her to spend time with her terminally ill mother. So while this match may not have been a shoot, AJW did often feature what they called shoot pin matches, unbeknownst to spectators at the time. These matches would be worked as normal Normal, except the pinfalls were in play for keeps, and if you could hold your opponent's shoulder to the mat, then that's just what the result is. Of course, since it's pro wrestling, promoters would insist on faster counts for their preferred winner, among other subtle advantages, but this is about as close as AJW got to shoot contests, as it were. These types of matches were also typically featured lower down in the card to incentivize competitiveness among the younger class, as well as to protect the scripted nature of the more important bouts. With all that out of the way, the Loser Must Retire contest itself is an exemplary example of women's wrestling for its era, intensified by the emotional rift between Jackie Sato and Maki Ueda, and an arena packed with women who are positively fixated on any and all of their actions. You have never experienced a crowd this locked into a wrestling match. This sh really means something to them. And after a long and intense period of back and forth technical wrestling, the Budokan crowd becomes unglued when Maki seizes an opportunity for a top rope splash. It's truly the fans that make these bouts special and help transcend the knowledge gap for viewers today. 
If you need any help knowing whether a move was important or who they're currently pulling for, they will loudly and excitedly let you know. After more than 20 minutes of battle in a match where Maki Ueda accidentally invents the fighting spirit hope spot and kick out at one, all within the span of 30 seconds, that's what we call a legend, Jackie forces Maki's shoulders to the mat with a high stack pin, ending the career of her former partner. The crowd positively erupts in a mixture of rapturous elation and complete and utter devastation. There's a ceremony, a 10 bell salute, and as girls from the crowd scream out in grief, Jackie and Maki pick up their microphones for one last performance. It's a surreal and emotional moment and something you've got to experience. There is really nothing else like this in pro wrestling to compare it to. In episode two of Queen of Villains, Jigusa Nagayo finds herself on the verge of retiring from pro wrestling altogether, admitting as such to her opponent, Linus Asuka, the night before they're to have what should be a bog standard AJW match. Her only request to Asuka is that she's allowed to demonstrate all of her pro wrestling skills, including the use of karate, and to do it in as physical a manner as possible. Asuka agrees, and so the girls go all out, and in doing so, they discover the spark that would ultimately lead to the explosion known as Crush Gals. As far as the truth behind the fiction, by all accounts, it's true that Chigusa fully intended to retire following the match, but after delivering a fiery bout and impressing the higher-ups in the process, she found herself being induated with praise behind the scenes and changed her mind when she realized that she could wrestle her kind of match from then on. And what a decision that turned out to be, because not soon after, the duo would just about conquer the entire promotion. The match itself is a fun bout, though not quite on the level of chaos as depicted in the show. There's a bit of embellishment for the sake of enhanced drama, of course, but it's nonetheless a competitive match that does a great job at shaking the Korokan Hall audience to attention. You can also already start to see the evolution of women's pro wrestling when comparing this match between two relative rookies to the retirement match between Jaki Sato and Maki Ueda. The action is much faster paced, features a greater variety of techniques, and with more intense strength. Striking. Chigusa and Asuka not holding anything back certainly doesn't hurt in that regard. My favorite moment of this match comes around the 10 minute mark where Linus Asuka misses a key splash from the top turnbuckle, and Chigusa jumps on the chance by delivering a huge spinning roundhouse kick to Asuka's head with pinpoint accuracy. You can hear the crowd stun gasp, see heads whipping around to see how others are reacting. Chigusa hits her with a second roundhouse kick and the reaction is even greater. While wrestling fans at the time had seen martial arts being deployed in pro wrestling thanks to Tiger Mask, it was still an incredibly rare sight, especially in regards to women's wrestling. You know what I just realized these first two matches also have in common? Not featuring Dump Matsumoto. Let's change that with an important match and the true birth of an icon. Earlier I had mentioned how Queen of Villains largely sticks to the facts, but Kaoru Matsumoto's turn towards the dark side may be where the producers took the most liberties. Episode 3 follows Kaoru during what may as well be the worst day of her life, finding herself after after a lifetime of being disrespected, falling behind her friends and peers in pursuit of her pro wrestling dreams. She feels betrayed by someone she thought of as her best friend, and her abusive, absentee father is using her mother to run a scam with what little notoriety she's earned as a rookie pro wrestler. During a scuffle, Kaoru is pushed through the wall of her childhood home in a scene that's both shocking and kind of hilarious as a callback, landing in her loathsome father's dump truck where she finds her iconic weapon of choice and proceeds to march straight into the AJW event, street clothes and all, and basically assaults everyone in sight to declare her new persona. In reality, by all accounts, Kaoru Matsumoto was well-liked backstage and fought against locker room hazing culture. As for the name Dump Matsumoto, <laughs> the creative liberties make for a more exciting story, I suppose. The next match I recommend checking out is what can be considered the true birth of Dump Matsumoto. The 1984 two out of three falls tag bout between Crush Gals and Devil Masami with Dump Matsumoto. This match is featured towards the end of Queen of Villains' third episode, only with the masked Crane Yu filling in for Dump, who, as previously mentioned, is currently occupied somewhere else. While the match here greatly differs from the real life bout, the end results are essentially the same. 
Dump blatantly disregards Devil Masami's wish to keep the match civil, sneaking weapons into the ring, and frequently calling in Crane Ute for assists. Seriously, if you thought Prime Era Bullet Club cheating was annoying, if you thought the constant bloodline interference was bad, y'all, this had me shouting at the TV. Are you kidding me with this? Get some control out here, ref! Holy hell. Alright, I think I'm starting to understand why these packed arenas were losing their minds over this shit. After the match is thrown out due to the constant rule breaking from Dump and Crane, the two turn their attention to Devil Masami, resulting in the complete disillusionment of Masami's Devil Army. Dump and Crane are actually cool with this, and with the newly christened Bull Nakano, will soon reveal themselves to the world as the Atrocious Alliance, one of the most reviled heel factions to ever step foot in a wrestling ring. I really enjoyed watching this one as the two out of three falls nature meant that there was a lot of opportunities for everyone to get their moves in, and it was cool seeing Dump hit some huge lariats and technical moves. Something the show doesn't do a great job about is showing Dump as a well-rounded wrestler. She's rarely attacking anyone in the ring without a weapon in hand on the show, and I feel it kind of sells her skills a bit short. Something to keep an eye on while watching this one, because the last match I'm going to recommend? Um... And there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, technical finesse, if you know what I'm saying. The final episode of Queen of Villains revolves around the climactic 1985 hair vs. hair death match between Crush Gals Chigusa Nagayo and the Atrocious Alliance's leader, Dump Matsumoto. An estimated 14 million homes in Japan tuned in for the event, and the sold-out Osaka Joe Hall crowd are among the loudest, most raucous audience ever captured for a pro wrestling match. It's a bloody affair with both Dump and Chigusa going to inhuman lengths in their respective roles, with Dump inflicting some of the most brutal acts yet seen in a pro wrestling match, and Chigusa fighting with every ounce of strength and heart imaginable all set to the sounds of a frantic and horrified audience. While the matches depicted in the show as being a bloodier affair than it really was, I'd argue that there's no substitute for the real thing in this instance, as the actual match is far more dramatic and surreal a scenario than could ever be recreated. Chigusa's final act of defiance before being dragged back into the ring to receive her punishment still sends chills to this day, while Chigusa's partner, Asuka, watching on helplessly is an incredible visual, as is the entire audience going through just about every stage of grief together. Queen of Villains does what it can to ratchet up the drama whenever possible, but I promise you've never seen anything like this reaction before in pro wrestling, and this is one case where the show sells the drama a bit short. One of the most incredible matches and moments in the history of pro wrestling, something that every fan should experience to see the true depths of emotion wrestling is capable of drawing out. Finally, the last historical video I recommend isn't a match at all, but a Crush Gals performance. In case you saw this scene of Chigusa and Asuka performing their hit song Bible of Fire and thought, Okay, well, this is ridiculous and incredibly 80s, and there's no way that they did an entire in-ring concert with giant smoke cannons. And I'm here to tell you, Queen of Villains uh, actually undersells this performance. The originators of blending pop idol music with pro wrestling theatrics, Mok Fumiyake, Beauty Pair, and Crush Gals all regularly perform their music in ring, typically to kick off the shows before the action. Queen of Villains' take on this scene is actually pretty accurate, even down to actor Victoria Grace's portrayal of Chigusa's slightly awkward dance move and deer in a headlights excitement behind her eyes. The performance I'm linking here goes even crazier with the smoke machine, laser effects, and moody lighting. And if the combination of pop idol girls singing their hearts out before they kick someone's teeth in appeals to you, then you should probably be watching Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling on Wrestle Universe, where the Up Up girls proudly continue this tradition, opening every TJPW show with one of their incredibly catchy numbers before pummeling the absolute dog shit out of their opponents. They're also, to my knowledge, the only pop idol group you essentially have to get jumped into and quite frankly, we love to see it. Now we just gotta get those girls some smoke cannons. Raku wants the smoke. And on a related note, if you're at all curious as to the story behind the cast learning the ins and outs of pro wrestling, they were trained and supported by Chigusa Nagayo herself and her promotion, Marvelous, That's Women's Wrestling. I'll have links in the description below with cast interviews where they go into greater details. Okay, we've talked quite a bit about where the fact meets fiction in Netflix's The Queen of Villains, and so to help fill in those real-world knowledge gaps, I've got some YouTube videos to recommend. The first stop I'd want to make after watching this show would be Kim Justice's Wrestling Road, where they've got an incredibly well-researched video chronicling the rise of Japanese women's pro wrestling from the early 
early days of post-World War II and through the era of Dump Matsumoto and Crush Gals. Kim is well regarded in the online wrestling scene for applying their incredible writing wits and attention to detail towards Japanese men's wrestling from the 1990s, so seeing them start to tackle the storied history of Japanese women's wrestling has been a real treat. Afterwards, stick around their channel and check out their recently released video on the career of Japanese women's wrestling's first major heel, Monster Ripper. You may remember hearing that name coming up a number of times throughout the show, and they even squared off against a young Karu Matsumoto in their debut match. Unfortunately, that match was seemingly made up for the show. Sorry about that. But the story of the real Monster Ripper is a fascinating one in its own right, so be sure to check that out along with the rest of Kim's incredible channel catalog. If you're looking for a more introspective look at the history and culture surrounding women's pro wrestling, Zafser's AJW and the Identity of Women's Wrestling approaches the subject with a more global perspective while diving into the unique challenges facing women and the perilous nature of their status and legacies within the industry. It features a number of stories regarding the hardships women face in finding equal treatment within the ring that were new to me, as well as the thoughts and opinions of women currently involved in the wrestling space today. It's a deep, thought-provoking dive into the corners of the space that you may not even be aware existed, and I can't recommend it enough. Make some time for this one. There's a moment during Queen of Villains' third episode where Chigusa mentions a magazine interview that she'll be participating in to be conducted by an up-and-coming New Japan Pro Wrestling star at the time, Akira Maeda. They even show a magazine cover with the wrestler, and this is kind of funny for a number of reasons. Firstly, the name Crush Gals itself has a direct connection to Maeda, being a combination of his nickname, Crush, and Gals, a popular Japanese teen magazine at the time. So while it's not directly called out in the show as an inspiration, this feels like a fun wink of acknowledgement from the showrunners. It's also not surprising that Maeda would take a liking to Crush Gals and their more physical style of wrestling because Akira Maeda is notorious for being one of the most aggressive, if not outright dangerous competitors in pro wrestling history, primarily for his innate desire for shoot fights. This man yearned for pure violence and utilized it to take himself and their UWF promotion to the very top of pro wrestling in Japan, if only for a brief moment of time. The story of Akira Maeda and shoot style wrestling is a fascinating one in its own right. And if you come out of Queen of Villains wondering what really happens when the lines of reality are blurred in pro wrestling, then Wrestling Collins' The Story of the UWF is a must watch video. Collins' video essays are always well researched, offering a fair yet thorough review of his subjects. And if you've seen some of the recent attempts at shoot style presentation in wrestling, such as Bloodsport or, uh, raw underground, I guess, uh, well, then you owe it to yourself to see what the concept can look like at its most extreme end, as well as learn about a number of promotions lost to time. See what happens when the world's most serious ass kicker tries to bend pro wrestling to his will. It's, it's crazy. Finally, if you're looking for more scripted dramas about pro wrestling, I've got a few recommendations, including a controversial documentary that will absolutely make your skin crawl in more ways than one. If you watch The Queen of Villains, then you probably have Netflix, which means you can already watch the next two best things, Glow and Heels. In a way, 2017's Glow, starring Alison Brie, is kind of the Mirrorverse version of Queen of Villains. Both shows tackle the world of women's pro wrestling in the 1980s, but where the Japanese-based women of Queen of Villains are fighting to show that their wrestling can be equal to and even surpass that of their male counterparts, the Los Angeles cast of GLOW are fighting simply for their right to exist. The contrast between how wrestling is portrayed across oceans is in plain view when watching these shows together, as well as how these differences affect their performers and their opportunities within the sport. Beyond pro wrestling though, GLOW is an incredibly charming and emotional ride, full of standout performances from the likes of Alison Brie, Mark Marin, Betty Gill, Open and Kia Awesome Kong Stevens. I can also see it being something of a palate cleanser post Queen of Villains because while it hits a lot of the same emotional highs, it tends to do so without the nonstop blood gushing violence, you know what I'm saying? And then there's Heels, starring Arrow's Stephen Amell. And to be honest, it's kind of a lot like Glow, only set in contemporary times, and if it starred a bunch of scowling tough guys whose favorite pastime is punching drywall. It's certainly the grittier of the two shows and is a lot more interested in the business aspects and relationships within the greater wrestling space as well. Big, I spend a lot of my time on wrestling reddits and know the secret jargon energy a lot of the time, 
And while I sound like a hater, it can still be a pretty fun watch. Certainly worth a look to see if it's to your taste. Sticking to the grittier recommendation, Darren Aronofsky's 2008 classic The Wrestler is a must watch for both fans of wrestling and cinema. If Queen of Villains perfectly captured the absurd and surrealist intensity of pro wrestling, The Wrestler is the other side of that coin, contrasting with its cold, harsh reality of the sport. Mickey Rourke puts in an all-timer performance as Randy the Ram Robinson, once one of wrestling's biggest stars in the business, who's fallen on hard times as he tries to reconcile his fading legacy while still chasing the high of being in the ring. This is Aronofsky at the peak of their directorial career, and after you've watched this, I'd recommend you also take a look at their following film, 2010's Black Swan. The two films are some of the rawest, most gripping explorations of artists in two mediums considered to be polar opposites on the class spectrum, and they complement each other in unexpected ways. Seriously, check it out. My final recommendation is a documentary, and it's the 2000 film Gaia Girls. And if you know what that film is, then your jaw probably fell to the floor. Like, holy sh**. Why is the anime boy trying to get people to watch what amounts to a snuff film at times? But I think it's important to face the reality of the things that we love. And when it comes to pro wrestling, separating the art from the artist can feel like an impossibility. And that now feels like the challenge of revisiting Gaia Girls in a post-Queen of Villains context in regards to the legacy of one of its central figures, Chigusa Nagayo. Gaia Girls is a harrowing look at what it takes to survive a women's pro wrestling dojo, specifically the titular Gaia promotion founded by Chigusa Nagayo in 1995. Its main focus is a trainee, Saika Takaguchi, a timid young recruit who dreams of stepping into the ring to discover her true, confident self, which sounds a lot like why Chigusa stepped into the ring herself. But is this dream worth walking through hell? Most of the film, Saika is seen swollen-faced, eyes full of tears, blood streaked across her face as she withstands an incredible amount of punishment that quickly crosses a line between brutality and exploitation. In its most infamous scene, renowned wrestler and head trainer for Gaia at the time, Mako Satomura, hits Saeko with a drop kick during a training session that leaves her lip dangling off her face. The camera watches silently throughout the film, and it's this voyeuristic element that makes these scenes so haunting. You're just a witness to these horrible events, watching a scared, beaten woman be chastised by her idols. Nagayo is a constant presence in the film, and a chilling one at that. When a trainee who previously quit the dojo returns, Chigusa's greeting is nonchalantly threatening to kiss her if she tries to quit again. There's a coldness to this moment that makes you think she might actually be serious about this. And so, when that same trainee flees the dojo in the middle of the night, you understand why she might not want to take that chance. If this all sounds like way too much for you, or just something you don't feel you need to experience, I completely understand. And because of that, I have another wrestling column video to recommend, their retrospective on the film, which I'll have linked below, just like every other video I've mentioned so far. And that's it. Sorry for all the trauma there at the end, but hey, that's pro wrestling, baby. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end. You, my friend, are a real one. Be sure to subscribe for more videos and join the Discord. We talk a lot about women's wrestling and especially TJPW. So if you want to hear more about cute idols who kick faces in, you'll want to check out that server. And remember, pro wrestling is for everyone and pro wrestling can be anything.